Amen. Well, Merry Christmas, church. Pleasure to be with you all this, on this beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, I think it's been an awesome Advent season. I think that we've had some really good services, some meaningful services, and I think that um, I don't think we could ask for anything more than what we've shared over the last five weeks. And this, of course, is the culmination of the Advent season on Christmas Day when we celebrate Jesus Christ being born into the world, um, God's only begotten Son. Uh, one quick note, this is our last Sunday together, uh, Christmas Day. At the end of the service today, I've printed straight from the United Methodist Book of Worship, there's an order of far farewell to a pastor, I've got them here, I'll pass them out toward the end of the service. This is a liturgy, it's a back and forth conversation between myself and the congregation in which I bless you, you bless me. I ask for forgiveness for anything that I've done. You all say, we forgive you, and we ask for forgiveness for anything we've done, and I say, I forgive you, and then we all go forth in peace, having blessed the future ministry of one another. So when the time comes, that's what I'll be handing out, and that's what this is. So um, it's pretty common, and I found it to be somewhat meaningful. Um, let's go to God in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you today. We thank you for Christmas Day. God, we thank you that we are able to worship in such a beautiful sanctuary, a beautiful house of God, uh, and come together all as a church family to celebrate this moment in time in which you sent your only begotten Son to take on flesh and to come into the world to go about his ministry and ultimately die and be resurrected to reconcile us back to you, God, and to forgive us for our sins. God, we pray for those who cannot be with us this morning, that they are traveling safely, and that they know that we are with them in spirit. We ask that you will help us to be calm in mind and body and spirit, and help us to put our full focus on worshiping you, to hearing your gospel being preached, to lifting up your holy name in our hymns, God. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Let's announce our call to worship together. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen His glory. Good morning. Please stand as you're able and join us in our first hymn, Joy to the World, found on page 246 in your hymnals and on the screen. Sounding joy, 
Repeat the sounding joy. Repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more let sins and sorrows grow. No point in the first long ground he comes to make his blessings flow. For as the curse is bound, for as the curse is bound, for as, for as the curse is bound. He rules the world with truth and grace, and makes the nations love the glories of his righteousness, and wonders of his love, and wonders of his love, and wonders, wonders of his love. You may be seated. Our Psalter reading is found on United Methodist Hymnal, page 818. This is from Psalm 98. We'll be doing response number one. Sing a new song to the Lord, who restores the ends of the earth. Sing a new song to the Lord, who restores the ends of the earth. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. For the Lord has done marvelous things. God's right hand and holy arm have gotten the victory. The Lord has declared victory and has revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. The Lord has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Sing a new song to the Lord, who restores the ends of the earth. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, Make a joyful noise before the ruler, the Lord. Sing a new song to the Lord, who restores the ends of the earth. Let the sea roar in all that fills, fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord, who comes to judge the earth. The Lord will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Sing a new song to the Lord, who restores the hands of the earth. Living God, Furnish us the courage and ability to integrate Jesus' life into our own. Stir our hearts and souls to receive your Holy Spirit. May this Spirit give us boldness where we have none in order to be Christ's people in the world. Like small children who reflect the joy and wonder of seeing a manger scene, create in us the same sense of gratitude and joy. We celebrate this day as a day when you revealed your goodness and mercy to all your children. This gift of Jesus' incarnation 
is truly the Christmas gift for which we have all waited. May you, O oh God, continue to raise us up to new life in Christ. As we pray to you the words that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, and as we pray together now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day. To save us all from sin and power when we were gone astray. O tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. O tidings of comfort and joy. From God, our Heavenly Father, a blessed angel came, and unto certain shepherds brought tidings of the same, how that in Bethlehem was born the Son of God by name. O tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. O tidings of comfort and joy. Please stand as you're able and join us in our second hymn, Infant Lo Holy, Infant Lowly, which can be found on page 229 in your hymnals or on the screen. Infant Holy for his bed a cattle stall, oxen lowing, little knowing, Christ the babe is Lord of all, swift a winging, angels singing, Noel's ringing, tidings bringing, Christ the babe is Lord of all. Locks were sleeping, shepherds keeping, vigil till the morning knew. Saw the glory, heard the story, tidings of the gospel true. Thus rejoicing, free from sorrow, praises voicing, greet the morrow, Christ the babe was born for you.
Our Old Testament reading comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 52, verses 7 through 10. How beautiful on the, upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, who brings good news, who announces salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, you sentinels, lift up their voices. Together they sing for joy, for in plain sight they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth together into singing, you ruins of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Our New Testament reading comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4 and 5 through 12. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son? Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his servants flames of fire. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And in the beginning, Lord, you founded the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like clothing. Like a cloak, you will roll them up, and like clothing, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will never end. This is the word of God for the people of God.
faithful for our gospel reading. This is from the book of John. It'll be a familiar passage. John 1, verses 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in Him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light, the true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory as of a Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. This is the Word of God for the people of God. God. Please be seated. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you for the opportunity to bring your message this morning. God, I ask that you give me strength where I am weak. God, let all that I say be pleasing and acceptable in your sight and holy in nature. God, give me strength, prop me up, and yet hide me behind the cross, Lord, so that all things will be to your glory and to none other. God, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is a well-known verse. I think everybody has heard this probably many times. Uh, It's the first first 14 verses of the book of John, one of the four Gospels. Now the Gospel of John is much different from the other Gospels. You have four Gospels. Three of them are called synoptic Gospels. That's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And that means that they are very similar in nature. They all tell pretty much the same story, but through a different vantage point. When you get to the book of John, you find something completely different, radically different from the three synoptic gospels. In the the synoptic gospels, you hear the story about the birth of Jesus, about the miracles that he performed, the people that he touched, the, the demons that he drove out, his teaching, the Sermon on the Mount, His crucifixion, death, resurrection, and all of these things. Many of those things you do not find in the book of John. In fact, 90% of what you find in the book of John is found nowhere else in the Gospels. And that includes the story of what happened before Jesus was born. In the book of Matthew, for example, we are given the whole lineage from Abraham down to Jesus to let us know... um, the part of him that was of man, the, the, uh, the human side of Christ, to show that he was, in fact, a descendant of David and therefore fulfilled the messianic prophecy of the Old Testament. In the book of John, it tells us what happens from the very beginning, where this Jesus of ours came from. And the first words in the book of John says, In the beginning was the word and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, I read that, and I feel like there's something familiar about that verse. When I hear the words, in the beginning, I feel like I've read that somewhere else. So we go back to the book of Genesis, and we go to the very beginning. Now, surely I can find this quickly. It's the first part of the book. In Genesis 1.1, it says, In the beginning, there it is, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God, which is oftentimes translated a breath of God, 
swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. There's that word light again. Jesus is the light of the world. He said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. So if we know from Genesis, one of the first things that we learn as little kids in Bible study is God creating the world, and we know that God created the heavens and the earth. Then we go back to our book of John and said, the Word, which was Jesus, the Logos, the eternal Logos, was God. We can, we can understand then that it was Jesus who created everything that exists. It was the Word, the Logos, Christ, the Christ child. One of the questions that's asked is, or is sometimes asked, was there a time ever that Jesus was not? Was there a time in all of history, before the creation of everything that exists, was there a time that Jesus did not exist? And the answer is no. Jesus is co-eternal with the Father. Now, this Trinitarian nature of God is difficult to comprehend many times. To understand how is it that Jesus was God and yet is also the Son of God and also the only begotten Son of God. How can they be co-eternal? And where does the Holy Spirit dwell in this? Well, the truth is, Jesus and God are one, and they have coexisted from the beginning of eternity. They created the Holy Spirit. The technical word is that they spirated the Holy Spirit. They brought the Holy Spirit into existence in order to help with the overall goal and will of God for his people. Later on, we see that Jesus, and I had to draw, I draw, I drew this, I spent an entire day mapping this out on a whiteboard, trying to understand how all this works. Because the Son is difficult to comprehend. When Jesus and God were creating the world, they knew that at some point Jesus was going to have to come into the world. God himself was going to have to take on flesh because we were a fallen people or we would become a fallen people. So Jesus and God the Father brought into existence the Holy Spirit and essentially said, listen, at this time and place in history, I need you to meet me in the world. Okay, Holy Spirit, I need you to go into the world and speak to the Virgin Mary and bring me into the world. That's how the Trinitarian economy works. So the Holy Spirit comes, talks to Mary, said, you are going to conceive and bear the child that is the Son of God. Later, when Jesus is crucified and dead and buried, he has arranged that three days later, the Holy Spirit is going to come and raise him from the dead. Because when he died, remember, he was also fully man. He was dead. He was not playing possum. He was not holding his breath. This was no David Blaine magic trick. He was dead. And he was relying on the Holy Spirit, the third part of the Trinity, to come and resurrect him from the dead. So we could say, therefore, Jesus was from the beginning. And all things that were brought into existence were brought into existence by Jesus. Now, it says in our passage that John the Baptist was in the wilderness. He was making statements such as, make straight, make straight the way of the Lord. The Lord is coming. John the Baptist was held in very high esteem. I believe he was divinely ordained to precede the coming of Christ and let everybody know there's a great light coming into the world, and that's what he was doing. He was telling everybody, I am not the light, because people were seeing what John the Baptist was doing. He's saying, there's a light coming into the world, but it's not me. I'm not the light. The light that's coming into the world, the Son of God is coming, the Savior, the Messiah. And I, and it's, we're told later in the gospel that there was none greater than John the Baptist up until that day, 
Even John the Baptist was unworthy to loosen the sandals of the one who was to come. So I have to think to myself then, why would John the Baptist have to tell everybody that a light was in the world? We all know that there's light in this room. I can look at that candle and see that there's light. There it is right there. Who is it that has to be told that there's light? It has to be those who cannot see. People who are blind cannot see light. They have to be told there is light because all they have is darkness. The people in, the, in this time when Jesus came into the world were spiritually blind. If the light had come into the world, they would have no way of knowing it. They wouldn't recognize him. They might not even see him. And they certainly would not accept him, which is exactly what our passage says today, that he, even though he created the world and he was in the world and performing all these miracles, they fully rejected him. So John was telling the people, there is a light coming into the world, so be aware because he is coming to do great things. We have formed, in the time that I've been at Port Natchez, we have formed some incredible relationships. Um, I have thoroughly enjoyed getting to know all of you, and some of you I've spent many, many hours talking, talking about serious things, talking about not-so-serious things, talking about football and economics. and My favorite part of ministry is just talking with you all and, um, and praying with you, eating lunch with you, doing these kinds of things. Preaching is a small aspect of ministry, but I feel that the one-on-one -on -one connections that we have made are a greater aspect of a pastor's ministry than what he does from the pulpit. The pulpit's a great opportunity. We're all in here together. I've got all of you here in one place at one time. This is the best opportunity to preach the gospel. But I have found that you can, you can have a greater impact in getting to know people. And from that perspective, um, this hasn't been an easy three or four weeks lately. As I make the transition to a new church, you make the transition to a new pastor. But I want to say this, very much in the way that John the Baptist was talking about Jesus. He is saying, look, I am not the light, but there is one coming after me whose sandals I am not worthy to loosen. That person is Jesus. Jesus is the true light of the world. Jesus is the Savior. He is the great shepherd. It is not me. It is not whoever the pastor is from the pulpit. It makes no difference whose name is on the sign outside the pastor's office. You all are the church. And Jesus Christ is the true minister, the true light of the world. And he has come into our congregation. He has come into our community so that you all may testify to the light that has come. It's a funny thing about light is from the beginning of time, mankind has known, even the most primitive people around the world have known that daytime is better than nighttime because in the night, everything is dark. You can't see anything. All you hear are strange noises and predators lurking around. And, and in ancient times, when people were living in caves, um, nighttime was very, very scary. If you ventured out at nighttime, you might not come back. We used to go camping as a kid, and it was, we would be up in Oklahoma in a rural area where it's completely quiet and completely dark. And you could lay in your tent at night, and outside your tent you would hear this crackling, right? Something's walking through the woods nearby. And you hear these sticks breaking, and you hear the rustling of the woods. And next thing you know, in your mind, there's a Sasquatch outside. This thing is huge. It's going to tear us to pieces. But when you build up the courage to stick your head outside the tent and shine a flashlight, it's a possum or it's a raccoon or something, right? 
our imaginations, many times what we envision might be out there in the dark is far worse than what is actually out there. So it is in shining light on the thing that we can have comfort. Once we know that's what it is, that's the truth, not what I believed might be the truth, but that's the truth, then we have comfort. We've always known that light is better than darkness. And we also know that light serves as a great disinfectant. I had a friend of mine one time, there was a, a fellow pastor, and his car got flooded. He left all his windows down, and it rained, and it just got ruined, and it smelled awful, and it was mildewy. So when the rain stopped, he went out there, and he tried to clean it up to the best that he could. And when he was done, he took it out in the parking lot where it was hot, and he opened up all the doors and left it there all day for the sunshine to come in. And the sunshine that came in did more to disinfect and clean that car than anything else that he could have done. When the light comes into the world, it has an incredible, incredible influence on our lives. It serves to bring us to know the truth, to know that which is true, that which is intrinsically true, in that God truly became man and, and came to the earth to save us from ourselves, independently and collectively, as a congregation, as a society. That is the truth. That is what we are told in the gospel. And as Christians, we believe that. We have it imprinted in our hearts that this great light has come into the world. And I pray that you will keep that light with you in all that you do. Be fervent in your prayer that God will illuminate the path in front of you. Because there will be stumbling blocks in all of us, in our individual lives. There is a rough and rugged road that we have to traverse. And there will be plenty of obstacles that we have to overcome. Overcoming them in the darkness would be far more difficult than overcoming them in the light. So I pray that through your prayers, through your continual prayers, through your discernment, through your reaching out for that relationship with God, that anything that you encounter individually in your lives, that you'll put your full faith that God will give you everything that you need to overcome that obstacle. The Christmas season, we celebrate the coming of Christ into the world. As I talked about before, we've heard the story so many times we take it for granted. We overlook it, we, uh, we decorate our Christmas trees, and we go out at the last minute and buy stocking stuffers for the family members we forgot about, grab a couple gift cards off the rack and try to slip them in a card for somebody. But we rarely truly take into account what Christmas means for us and is the greatest sacrifice that anybody could ever make. And our God, our suffering and dying God, came into the world to save us from ourselves. That is the greatest gift that we could ever receive. Amen. Will our ushers please come forward for this morning's offering? And once they get, once they start passing the plates out, I'm going to come behind and I'm going to distribute these to both sides. If you would take one and pass it along, please. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for the greatest gift of all that you have given to us. And we thank you for the blessings that you continue to bestow upon us. God, we ask this morning that you will help us to be responsible stewards with these resources that belong to you and to your church. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
children, mother and child. Holy infants are tender and mild. Sleep in heavenly peace. Sleep in heavenly Tonight, holy night, shepherd quick at the sight, bloody stream from heaven of Sing Hallelujah. Christ the Savior is born. Christ the Savior is born. So Tonight, holy night, Son of God, love's pure light, radiant beam from thy holy face. Redeeming grace. Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let's affirm our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join us in our final hymn, Angels We Have Heard on High, Found on page 238 in your hymnals. And on the screen. Angels, 
we have heard on high, sweetly singing on the plains, and the mountains in reply, echoing the joy of strain. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Shepherds by this jubilee, by your joy all strains prolong. What a glad summer tidings be, which inspire your heavenly song. Christ, whose birth the angels sing, come on, on a bend at me. Christ, the Lord, the newborn King, Lord, in excelsis Whom the choirs of angels praise, Mary, Joseph, lend your aid, while our hearts in love we raise. Gloria in excelsis Deo. one of those copies I handed out? I handed out all of them. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> okay, if you would please uh, join me in this. I thank you, members of First Methodist Church of Fort Natchez, for the love and support you have shown me while I have ministered among you. I am grateful for the ways my leadership has been accepted. I ask forgiveness for the mistakes I have made. As I leave, I carry with me all that I have learned here. We receive your thankfulness, offer forgiveness, and accept that you now will be the minister of the new community. We express our gratitude for your time among us. We ask your forgiveness for our mistakes. Your influence on our faith and faithfulness will not leave us. I accept your gratitude and forgiveness, and I forgive you, trusting that our time together and our parting are pleasing to God. I release you from turning to me and depending on me for pastoral leadership, and I encourage your continuing ministry here, and I will pray for you and your new pastor. Let us pray. Eternal God, whose steadfast love for us is from everlasting to everlasting, we give you thanks for cherished memories and commend one another into your care as we move in new directions.
Keep us one in your love forever. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And I will say this for the final time. Go forth with the peace that surpasses understanding, knowing that you are redeemed by the precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.